we're in uh, Colossians chapter 2. Let's begin reading together at verse 1. We'll read verses 1 through 3, and we'll get into our study. Colossians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1 and uh, reading to verse 3. Paul writes, I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea and for as, as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And what I'm going to do again is I'm going to remind you of some of the things that we've been looking at. I'll refer back to verses 28 and 29 in chapter 1, pick up on that, and move into our chapter study here in Colossians. Today we'll be going through verses 1 through 10, beginning obviously with verses 1 through 3. But as we're looking at this, I'm going to read verses 28 and 29 again, where it says in chapter 1, where it says, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. And so Paul has written, Him we preach, warning and teaching every man. As I mentioned before, the word warning there, when he uses that word warning, it means to admonish or exhort. And what he's saying is, I've attempted to awaken people to their need for Jesus Christ. And so he says there, he says, Him we preach. I am exhorting people to to understand who Jesus is and give their lives to him. He speaks about teaching, and uh, when you see teaching, him we preach, warning every man, and teaching every man, when he uses the word teaching, he's speaking concerning um, helping young converts to understand the basics, the rudiments of, of Christian faith, as well as encouraging those who have been walking with the Lord for a while to continue to mature in their understanding as believers. And so he's speaking of warning and he's speaking of teaching and he's saying that this has a purpose and the purpose of warning and teaching is to present every man perfect in Christ. Now what did he mean when he spoke of presenting every man perfect in Christ? Well, the word perfect means something that is brought to its end. It speaks of being finished or lacking nothing. It's being full grown, a full age. It speaks of maturity. So he's saying the purpose of preaching and teaching is so that people may become fully mature. The ministry of preaching and teaching, preaching very often is, is, a, a, is a gift of the, of the Spirit where that you are, you are speaking the Word of God in such a way as to encourage people to make a decision. And teaching is a way of encouraging people to apply that which they're learning. And so the minister preaches and the minister teaches. And with the, with the end of bringing people to spiritual maturity. And so that's what he's talking about. Paul is speaking of complete Christian maturity. Pastor teachers are commanded to teach and to encourage people to mature, as well as to protect people from spiritual error. Teaching the whole Bible does this. When the word is received in faith by the hearer, they are being equipped for works of service and they're being protected. They're maturing when they apply it and they're protected from deception. When Paul was writing to the Ephesians in chapter 4, he said it like this, verses 11 through 15. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. And so the purpose of preaching and teaching is maturity. It's to safeguard believers from being deceived. It's to keep them from being tossed to and fro by every hurricane force gale that enters into the church intending to destroy the faith of those attending. So the evidence of maturity is that you are no longer tossed around by error. You know, there are those believers who, who like loud preaching. They like many stories. They, they like exciting singing. But they don't put up with teaching. And because this is true, there are many pastors who carefully avoid teaching the whole counsel of God because they desire people to fill the pews. 
And because they want people to fill the pews, they don't want to take the risk of offending sensitive hearers. Charles Spurgeon once said it like this. He said, I do believe we slander Christ when we think we are to draw the people by something else but the preaching of Christ crucified. There are people who want to hear anything but Christ crucified, and they want to be entertained. But somebody said, I do not expect my doctor to be entertaining, just competent and experienced. You need to remember that you don't learn all there is to know the moment you are saved. The time of being born again is only your starting point. The exploration of the wisdom that resides in Jesus is really a task of a lifetime. And so how do we come to spiritual maturity? How do we become those mature believers, perfect or, or mature in our faith? How does that happen? Well, it happens through simple faith-filled obedience, putting into practice what God has revealed. You see, Jesus in John 14, 15 said it like this. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, there are a lot of people who say, well, I do. I love Jesus Christ. But loving Jesus is revealed by obedience to what he's taught in his word. It's not an emotion that people are kind of looking at Jesus like a boyfriend. It's a relationship that they have with him where his word means something to them. In John 14, 21, Jesus said, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it's he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So you love me, you keep my word. And how do we learn his word? Through the teaching of the word of God. And so because Paul was concerned for the believers, he labored to encourage maturity. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he strove to inspire and instruct believers. And this concern was for the church at large. He mentions it in verse 1 here in chapter 2, including the Laodiceans. Notice what he says in verse 1, chapter 2, where he says, I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. And so he's saying, I'm concerned. I'm concerned for you, but I'm also concerned for the church in Laodicea. If you were looking at a map and you saw the city of Colossae, Laodicea was about 10 miles to the north. And in chapter 4, verse 13, he mentions another uh, city called Hierapolis, which was in the same general area. So he's concerned for believers. Paul wanted to let them know of his concern. So we'll, be, we'll begin by looking at this. This reveals something very tender about the apostle Paul. Paul actually loved them. I want you to see this. Look at verse 1 again. I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. The word conflict is a Greek word, A-G-O-N, agon. And it's where you get the word agony or agonize. It speaks of an internal conflict. It speaks of a contention of heart. It speaks of anxiety. I want you to know I have anxiety of heart. I have agony over your spiritual condition. Hearing that there are false teachers entering into the church has caused him to be greatly concerned. Why? Because he cares about them. He cares about their spiritual health. When you read about Paul, you'll need to remember that Paul had a father's love. He was extremely protective for these people and their spiritual lives. That's a, a love that is revealed in other books. For example, to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2 and 3, he said it like this to them. He said, I'm jealous for you with godly jealousy. I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear that somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I don't want you to be um, messed up by these false teachers. Paul had a great love for the church. He cared about them deeply. It was a kind of love that caused inner conflict. It, it caused an agony within the heart of Paul. He said something similar to the Galatian church in chapter 4, verse 19, when he said, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. I'm going through labor pains. I want to see your maturity. And I love you. I want to see you walking in spiritual health. I want to see your spiritual maturity. It's difficult to reveal this kind of love to believers. Many don't understand even to this day. For some, this kind of concern being voiced seems more like an intrusion 
than love. And this is because they don't understand the love of a true shepherd and the love a true shepherd would have for the sheep. There's a, a, a scripture in 2 Corinthians 12, 15 that I love where Paul was speaking to the Corinthians. And this is what he said. And, and by the way, 2 Corinthians is what they have said is his most open-hearted letter. And he's writing to a church that is uh, filled with division and carnality. And he's writing to a church that has been invaded by false teachers that are referred to as the super apostles, the eminent apostles, who have been saying things about him. I mentioned that they lodged no less than 24 accusations against this great man of God. And so he's writing to them, the Corinthians, and he wants them to know his heart towards them and he's correcting the error and he's, and he's confronting uh, the false teachers in that letter. And he goes on and he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15 to say this. He says, I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. And that's an open-hearted thing to say as a pastor, as a shepherd. The more that I give of my life, the more that I spend of my energy, the more that I've yielded to the Lord on your behalf, and the greater I love you, the less I'm loved by you. I can tell you as a pastor, there were times in my ministry where I've had somebody that I was speaking to sometimes in my office, and I can tell you the truth in this and that, that I've said to them with tears and sometimes wept in the room as I'm trying to minister to them. I can tell you how many people, I can't tell you how many over the years have not understood that kind of love for them felt that I was trying to lord it over them, tried to dominate their faith. And, uh, and I've been able to understand a bit of what Paul was saying. The more I love you, the less I'm loved by you. The more I'm open to you, the less you care, the less it matters to you. You see, deceivers were entering into meetings. They were changing the gospel. They were seducing young believers. And, and he was concerned that the believers would be cheated out of their growth in Christ. If they embraced the error, they would suffer loss of eternal rewards. It's like what John in 2 John 8 says, the apostle John wrote, look to yourselves that we do not lose those things which we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward, that we may not lose those things we work for, that we may receive a full reward. Somebody said, this is a reward that is built on grace. God has, by His grace, promised a reward to those who love and serve Him. It is founded on His grace. It will be given to them through His grace after their work is over, like wages are given to a worker when he has completed the job. So the faithful life results in reward, and those who are deceived will lose reward. In 1 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15, Paul said, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. You know, so yeah, you'll enter in, but you're going to be smoking when you get in. Like Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner, holding that dynamite stick, and then it goes off, and there you are standing there just smoking. And that's how some people are going to enter into heaven. I've shared this before. I used to work at this particular place um, that uh, used, to, used to produce uh, drilling uh, kinds of uh, drill bits and things for, uh, for, for oil wells. And so it was, a, it was a job that required a lot of work with metal. And, and this one guy, I forget his name, is an older fellow at that time. He had to be at least in his 40s. I was, I was about 19. But now he was in his 50s. And he, he is uh, kind of a a short guy, thin, he had real white hair, and we had these blast furnaces, and this furnace uh, had, a, it had a shaft, and he would get this long tube, and he would put a light, he would put a, a, a match at the end of it, and he would light the match, and then he would slide the tube, the, uh, this tube with, the, with the, the match at the end, he would slide it down, and then the pilot light that was, you know, on would ignite and that would you know, get the blast furnace going. And it was uh, one of these furnaces that, that produced a lot of heat. And I was standing by him one day 
when he was talking to somebody and he had turned the gas on and forgot that he had turned the gas on. And he's just talking and talking. And I was standing maybe 20 feet from him. And then he lights the match and slides it down the tube. And when he slid it down the tube, the gas buildup exploded. It exploded with such force that these big old metal doors exploded off the hinges. And the, the flame came out. And I, it was like a starter pistol to me. When it went off, I was out the door. It was like, go. And I was, I was gone. And I remember looking in at him, and he was still standing like this. And his hair was smoking. His hair was smoking. The flame had come out and had gone over him. And he's just... And I've never forgotten that. So when I read this verse, I think of him. And I don't want to go to heaven like that. I don't want to be standing before Jesus just kind of smoking. And that's what's going to take place in a way. Because it says, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, yet as so through fire. Now, anyway, going on. These are people who did not yet personally know Paul. But Paul was concerned for them. And with this in mind, he expresses his heart's desire for them. He had said again in verse 1, For as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, then verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. He says that he wants their hearts to be encouraged and knit together in love. And he says that he wants them to attain to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding the knowledge and mystery of God. So he wants their hearts encouraged, their hearts to be knit together, and that they would grow in their understanding of the Lord. So he desires this because false teaching results in discouragement. You see, when it says that their hearts may be encouraged, that word encouraged means to be strengthened or comforted. False teaching results in discouragement. I can't tell you, over the years, the conversations I've had with people who have become victims of false teaching, and they have lost their joy, and they're discouraged because they don't have the things that they think they're supposed to have. Because the false teachers have told them that they should have certain things, they don't have those things, they're discouraged. And that's what false teaching does. It discourages you. In John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus brings life in abundance. False teachers discourage. So to, to, to combat discouragement, Paul desires them to be strengthened and settled. You see, encouraged hearts speaks of being strengthened in the mind, not simply the emotions. We need to remember that emotions are activated by what the mind perceives. You feel what you believe. That's why some people can be going through hard times of a relationship, and they believe that the person that they're so in love with doesn't love them anymore. They're feeling that when the facts may not be that way at all. I had to learn that as a young man, that, that sometimes the person you're with may not be acting as if they care for you. And you can start thinking, they don't love me. They don't care for me anymore. I remember when Marie and I, my wife and I, were dating. I'm not a telephone guy. As a matter of fact, I pretty much hate the phone in many ways. I use it, I have to. But it's not one of those things like, oh, I have to rush home and get on the phone. I hate the phone. And I just don't like it. And so I called Marie. To me, that was a big, big sacrifice. I don't like to talk on the phone. So I call her up, you know. I think to ask her out or to see how much she loves me, I forget. But I, I called her up. And when I called her up, she was kind of like aloof. She was like not wanting to talk. And I, I'm thinking, she doesn't care about me. She doesn't care. This happened last week. No, it didn't. I'm just, <laughs> I'm thinking, she doesn't care about me. And I told her, I said, you know what? I'm wasting my time. I shouldn't have called you up. And she says, oh, and she says, you know, I've just had a bad day and this and that. My feelings were telling me, because of the way she was acting at that moment, that she didn't care for me. But the facts were different than that. So we have to be careful that our feelings don't become our facts. 
And sometimes people will believe things by their feelings, not by what's being said. And you cannot have a walk with God that's based on how you feel at the moment. It has to go deeper than that. Because he wants to bring encouragement to these who are being discouraged by bad teaching. And the way for them to be encouraged is to hold God's promises to heart. To meditate on those things that matter. To understand that their feelings don't dictate the reality of their faith. In Philippians 4 verse 8, Paul said, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So we guard our hearts and we direct them towards pursuing the Lord through His Word. It's like what Joshua chapter 1 verses 6 through 9 says, where it reads, Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So false doctrine brings bondage, but God's grace and truth brings freedom. Deceit undermines the comfort God gives and brings bondage to self-effort. Self-effort to be saved produces frustration or pride. Trusting in Christ, relying on His teachings, produces peace and freedom. In John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus said, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So He says He wants that also. He says, Be knit, knit together in love. So Christians are to love one another and be united in Christ. Bad doctrine separates the body of Christ because bad doctrine causes division. And the fruit of deception is self-righteous, thin-skinned, argumentative disciples. So what is the emblem of a real Christian? Love for God and love for other people. Jesus in John 15, 17 said, These things I command you that you love one another. In Romans 13, verse 8, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 9, Concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. So love binds us together. And Jesus prayed that his disciples would be one, united in him. In John 17, 20 and 21, he said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. You see, this unity of the Spirit that he's praying for is something that we pray for. In Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, he said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then he says, attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding. Believers see Jesus and loving others, especially believers, as of great value. The full assurance of understanding is an invaluable possession. It's the fuel that ignites our love for Jesus and love for others. It cements our hearts. It should be recognized as having great worth. This false teachers that are entering in will lead people to seek knowledge, but not ever really knowing what it is. The fruit of such a futile search is always pride. You see, what happens is when you begin to substitute information for God himself, when you begin to think that you're mature because you can quote scriptures, which I think we all ought to be able to, but when we think that we're more mature than somebody else because we can quote more scripture, we can make a big mistake. We need to remember that during the time of the writing of the Bible, that the Greeks thought that knowledge was the, was the 
uh, gathering in of information. So if I knew a lot of things, they say that I was knowledgeable. But the Jews didn't think that way because the Jews would say, no, knowledge is the assimilation of information that produces a transformation. It's not just, in other words, being able to quote something. It is being changed by that which you say you know. So knowledge isn't just having information. Knowledge to the Jew was transformation. That's why Jesus would say, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's why he would teach his people, teach us, to not only know his word, but to really know him. And, and that's the whole point of, of gathering information. It's not so that I can quote scripture, but that I may know the one who inspired it. Because eternal life is this, and know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That's why Jesus would say, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? That's why he'd say, I have done this as an example unto you. Why? So that you might do the same. He was washing the feet of his disciples. He said, I am doing this so that you may see a living lesson, so that you'll know what servanthood is. It's not simply talking about washing feet. It's actually caring for people. See, so Christianity is not the accumulation of information. Christianity is knowing God, and that's what he's saying. He's saying, I want you to know him, to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want you to know the truth, but to remember that the truth is not simply a bunch of things that you believe. It's Jesus himself who is the truth. And so that's what he wants them when you seek pri them to do. When you seek primarily after Christ, then you'll receive assurance from him. In Romans 8, 15, it says, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The word Abba, when you're in Israel, you may be walking down a street and you'll see a little boy and his mama and daddy and you'll hear the little boy and he will say, Abba, and he'll be speaking to his dad because the word Abba there is really translated daddy. It speaks of a tender relationship of a child with her father. And so there are those who say, well, God, our father, and yes, he is my father, but it's deeper than that. He's my daddy. You know, he can say, who's your daddy? I can say you are. <laughs> you know, I had a real, real tender relationship with my own dad. My father went home to be with the Lord in 2001. I had a very tender relationship with my dad. And uh, I don't remember ever calling him dad. Perhaps I did. I don't remember. I, d I didn't call him dad. Even to the point when I was in my 50s and, and my father, you know, went home, even to be with the Lord, even there in, in the hospital when I was talking to him and ministering to him. I, I remember, for example, we were in, my dad had a heart attack and I was in the, um, the uh, ICU unit and my mom and I were there and, and uh, the, the nurse in charge said uh, I need to speak to you to my mom I need to speak to you my mom turns to me and she says I can't go in there she says you go in so I went in to the room where my dad was with the nurse and my dad was hooked up on this machine and all of that and, and I remember walking in standing there at my my dad was in front of me and the nurse was on the other side of the, of the gurney there. And he says to me, your father's in a lot of pain and he's not responding to my requests. You need to say something to him. You need to ask him if I can give to him a pain reducer. He says, I can't just give it to him. I need permission. And so you have to ask him. And I still remember... That was probably one of the last conversations, if not the last conversation that I would call a conversation. Last time I spoke to my dad while he was alive. And I still remember looking down at my father and I said, Daddy, Daddy. I didn't say pops or dad or father. I said, Daddy, because that was a tender thing between a son and a father. And, and I gave permission on his behalf for him to receive the medicine, but painkiller, but he went home to be with the Lord later that afternoon. There's that knowledge, though. Do you have that, by the way, of your God? That he's not simply Father. He is Father. Thank you for being my Father. 
But do you see him as your dad, as your daddy, with that love? Because that's what he has for you. Please understand that. Maybe you didn't have a man in your life that was dad, was father. Maybe you didn't have that. Maybe you didn't have someone who had listened to you, who had talked to you, who had laughed with you, who had taken you places, cared for you. Maybe you didn't have that. I, I understand. But you have a heavenly father that loves you like that. Do you know that? Do you know that today? That you have a heavenly father who loves you. And Paul said it's by his spirit. We call him daddy. We don't just call him father. Yes, he is. But it's deeper than that. It's a personal thing. It's something that's real. It, it, it has all of those things that matter, that's wrapped up. And that's why he says it's by the Holy Spirit. It's by the Holy Spirit that we refer to him as daddy, whereby we cry, Abba, we call him our father. So his desire was for them to have the knowledge of the mystery of God. Believers should desire for and mature to and have a complete conviction of their Christian faith. And he wants them to fully acknowledge the mystery of God in Jesus, that they might have no doubts that he is, no doubt about who Jesus is. And he makes it clear in verse 3, he says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Remember what he had said in verse 19 of chapter 1? It pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Well, in the midst of the error creeping in and reducing Jesus, Paul is saying Jesus is God. In him is hidden knowledge and wisdom. So there is no need to seek it anywhere else. The fruit of such a search is, hum is, uh, is, is, is uh, humility because we'll see ourselves in, in light of who he is. He's saying don't be looking for some esoteric truth and forget that truth is in Jesus Christ. Because in Jesus is hidden all the treasures, he says, of wisdom and knowledge. You don't need Greek mysticism. You don't need Jewish legalism. Jesus Christ is a fountain of all wisdom. It speaks concerning treasures. In him, he says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The word treasure refers to a receptacle in which valuables were kept. It speaks of a treasury. He's saying the wisdom and knowledge of God is safely secured. It is stored up in Jesus Christ. And since this is true, it's foolish to try to find answers from any other source. You see, for the Christian seeking direction from other religions isn't necessary. As I said recently before, I, I said when I came to faith in Christ, I didn't want to learn about him and then learn about Buddha or learn about Muhammad or learn about Krishna. I didn't want to add all, all those things together. I didn't need to because in Jesus Christ is the sum total of everything that I need. It's in Christ that I find every purpose and every answer. And it's in Jesus that, that I get these things. So I seek him first. It's like what Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1, 23 and 24. We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness, but to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God in whom he says are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He goes on in verse 4, Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words, with words that are intended to deceive. They're sales techniques to try and get you to buy into what they believe. He said, I'm saying this to protect you from deception through faulty reasoning. The word deceive means to delude by false reasoning. Persuasive speaks about leading others into error. False teachers are abounding. They're entering into the church and he's warning the church. He did so constantly. Again, in 2 Corinthians 11:13, 13, he said, such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. John warned the church in 1 John 4, verse 1. He said, do not believe every spirit. Test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Paul was always concerned that the message would remain pure. He was concerned for their spiritual welfare, you see, again, you live what you believe. False teaching ruins lives. And so he's sharing about that. Now, as he does so, verse 5, Though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, 
rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Paul is anticipating the response that will come because of the influence of false teachers. They could ask, how can you have conflict over people you don't even know? How can you express such love for us, having never even met us? You've never even been with us. How can you be aware of what is going on with us? See, they don't know him. Epaphras is the one who brought the gospel to them. Paul is concerned for them. But the false teachers would say, how can a guy who doesn't know you really love you? How is that possible? And there are people today in churches like this and throughout the world who would say the same thing. How can that person say he loves me when he's never even met me? And a false teacher can enter in and say, see, he's just saying things to try and get things from you. And that's simply not true. We love each other, though we may not know each other. May, we may never have coffee together, or visit together, know each other's uh, business. That, that may not ever happen. But that doesn't mean you can't love one another. That doesn't mean you can't care sincerely about somebody. That's what Christianity is, is we care for people, even strangers. You know, in the early, early history of the church, the, the Romans would speak concerning the Christians, and they would say that they were an odd sort because they call each other brother and sister. They're even incestuous because they marry brothers and sisters. And they said, and they said that they love one another. How can they do such a thing? But love is the emblem of the believer. You don't have to know somebody to have a love for that person. You know, the Lord has given me opportunities uh, over the years, for many years now, to minister in various places, uh, various, various times. And I'll, I'll speak in pastor's conferences or different churches or, or conferences, men's conferences, you name it. And, uh, and uh, there, are, there are times when I have gone out and I have shared with the people and I have said to them that I, that I love you. You know, and, and, and that's sincere, that's real. You know, I have a love for the body of Christ. And I can say it with sincerity. Even though I realize that, that uh, I may not get to know all the people. I, you know, I've been in this church for 30-some 30, 30 years, 38 years in July. And I, I can't say that I know everybody, and a lot of people don't know me. But that doesn't mean that I don't have a love for this church. That doesn't mean that I don't care. And one of the greatest ways that I can show love, and what Paul is doing here, is to, is to teach the truth, to encourage people to know Christ, to walk with Jesus, to stay away from error, to hold fast to Him, to love one another and serve God together. And that's what he's doing. And that's what he's sharing here. And the false teachers are saying, no, wait a minute, you have never even seen this man, Paul. How can you possibly be, hear from him that he loves you when in fact he doesn't even know you? But that's not the truth at all. He's saying, I'm with you. He's saying, I'm with you in spirit. My heart, my presence is with you, though I'm physically not with you. We belong to the same body, and I care for you. In 1 Corinthians 12, 26, it says, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. And so he says, this is what's taking place. Verse 5, though I am absent in the flesh, yet I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see, notice, your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. He speaks of good order. The words good order speak of a line of soldiers that are drawn up for battle, standing side by side. Steadfastness speaks of their feet being firmly planted. They're forming a solid line of defense. And he's saying, you have formed a line of resistance. You have remained untouched by the error. The church has not yielded to the pressure to embrace these false doctors. Now, when false doctrine enters the church, there are those who do embrace it. Second John verse 4 says, I rejoiced greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we receive commandment from the Father. There are those who will hear what's being said and will begin to follow after that. That's why John would say, some of you are walking in the truth because others have walked away. Well, Paul is concerned that none walk away. And so he says, rejoicing to see your good order. In verse 6 he says, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. How did they receive him? Well, they received him through grace and faith. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, By grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, and not of works, lest anyone should boast. 
So you receive Jesus through grace and faith, so live daily in grace and faith. Now, how do I walk in grace and faith? Well, my life is to be filled with good works. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We're to walk in love. Ephesians 5.2 says that. Walk in love. Their lives are evidenced by being separate from living in sin. Their walk means that they have a pure or a holy life. In 1 John 1, 6 and 7, if we say that we have fellowship with him and, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So we're to be walking in that way. And then he says in verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Rooted and built up. Rooted and built up in him. We're rooted in Christ because he's the source of all of our spiritual nourishment. The word rooted means to be established. It is to cause a person or a thing to be thoroughly grounded. We're to be built up. Built up speak of, speaks of finishing a structure of which the foundation has been laid. We're to be established. The word established means to be stable, to be firm. Faith in Christ gives us stability, and God establishes you. God gives you stability as he blesses you. In 2 Corinthians 1.21, he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us as God. You know, over the years, as I gave my heart to Christ, I was 20 years old, and now I'm 68 years old, 48 years of walking with the Lord. In 48 years of walking with Jesus Christ, you know, I began on solid ground with Christ, but shaky in my unformed faith. But over the years, I've been rooted and grounded and stabilized, and that happens through reading the Word and acting upon it. I've told my wife, Marie, we've had conversations like this in the past where I've said, listen, um, I have become a different man than the man you dated and the man you originally married. And that's a fact we all do. There's the influence of our mate who can help us to actually form us in ways because we have a tendency of responding to the way that they are. So had I married a different woman, I would probably have a different ministry. But in, ministry, in marrying Marie, and Marie, the way I've learned to adapt to her and all, and the way she's adapted to me, it's actually helped to form me into the person I'm up here uh, that I am as I stand up here. So blame her. And beyond that, <laughs> that's what happens. See, so you grow up, you mature, you learn certain things over time. So when you first get saved, you have that foundation. It's Jesus Christ. But over time, you build on it. You build on it through reading the Word. You build on it through fellowshipping with other believers. You, you build on it by learning to express your faith as you share it with other people. You build on it through a variety of ways. And over time, you're shaped by the Word. I've told Marie this, I'll say this also, that I was a liberal, very liberal in the way I thought. Not, not exactly like some of those that are referred to today as progressive. I wasn't like that. Uh, but I was exceptionally liberal in the way I thought. But over time, by being in God's Word, He actually sanitized my brains and transformed me. That's what happens. You're washed by the water of the Word. And as you read the Word, the things that at one time I thought, well, big deal, who cares, became things that I said, mm, those aren't things He's pleased with. So it was never something like, oh, I'm going to become a, a finger-waving Puritan preacher and yell at people because you're all sinners. No, because my mom taught me a long time ago. She says, when you point one finger at others, you've got three pointing at yourself. Don't forget that. So the Word of God, before it's proclaimed to others, needs first to, to filter into your own heart and transform you. And when you read the Word and you see this is what God wants, but this is the way people are, you first look and see, how can He change me? And as He's changing you, then you'll be able to pre preach a message that can encourage other people. It's not that you accept sin, you don't, but you learn to love the sinner. And so from my perspective, what happened in me is I got in the Word, I began to read, and I said, this is what God is pleased with, this is what He's not pleased with. I'm going to pursue Him. And as that takes place, I became safeguarded, and I now hold fast to the things that the Lord would be pleased with. 
That transformed my life. That influence was able to be also extended to my wife. It was given to my kids. It's part of my family. It's part of my relationships. And that's how it works. As Christians, we need to be rooted. We need to be grounded. We need to be built up in our most holy faith. We need to have an understanding of the things of the Lord, how it works, how we can put those things into practice. We need to be people who are firm and established. You know, I'm, I'm no intellectual. God knows that, and you have by now learned that also. But I will say this. You can't talk me out of Jesus Christ. You, can't, you cannot talk me out of Jesus Christ. You can't do that because I am established in him firm in him because he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. He says in verse 7, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Verse 8, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Beware. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. When he says beware, I'm going to roll to a conclusion, so I hope this makes some sense. When he says beware, he's saying that's your responsibility. That's each individual believer in this room. That's your responsibility. You beware. You be careful. You safeguard your faith. That's your responsibility. He's saying, do not fall into the trap of man's philosophy. He has said this. You have everything you need in Jesus Christ. In 2 Peter 1.3, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. You have everything you need. You don't need anything else. You don't need Ouija boards. You don't need horoscopes. You don't need anything like that. You just need him. Understand that today. You just need Jesus Christ. He is all that you need. We hold fast to his word because he has taught us through his word. Acts 20, 32 speaks of the word of his grace, which is able to build us up. And so we have to be careful, lest anyone would cheat us. Why? Verse 9, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Jesus inhabits the infinite nature of the supreme deity in human form. The very substance of God dwells in its most fullest sense in him. Like it said again in verse 19, it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. In John 1, 14, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So in him, verse 10, you are complete, who is the head of all principality and power. He who is the fullness of God has given us fullness in him. In John 1, 16, it says, and of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. We are complete in him. We do not need false teachings. Jesus made it clear that he is all that we need. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes on me shall never thirst. We have all that we need in Jesus Christ. Never forget that. You don't need to be hunting for something more because you have everything you need. Just concentrate your life on pursuing him, following him, and loving him. One of these days, and it's not that long, we'll stand before him, and we'll see him face to face. And we're going to be able to say to him, we love you, and we served you. And he's going to say, Come on in to the place I've prepared for you from the foundation of the world. We're going to be able to behold the eyes of the one who wept for us in the garden. We're going to be able to see the one who died on the cross for us. 
We're going to be able to, to, to hear the word of life spoken from his lips to our ears. Our, our, our life is going to be incredibly blessed at that moment. You're not going to wish that you had done something different. You're not going to wish that you had followed some other master. You're going to throw your crowns before his feet. You're going to kneel before him, and you're going to say, Jesus, I love you. Thank you for what you did. Oh, thank you for opening the gates of heaven. And Lord, I love you, and I'll love you for eternity. That's the way it's going to be. And so there's nothing else that you need. There's no other master. There's just the one, Jesus Christ. And we yield to him all that we have. You will never regret following Christ. There are times in your life where you may feel that you're not getting all that you would like. But you need to remember, you're not also, you're not getting what you deserve. And God, by his grace, is giving us his love, his forgiveness, his mercy, his compassion. He is giving to us those things that are necessary. He's working with us. We're never alone. He never, ever abandons us. He walks step by step. And though as we're walking, we may feel alone. We're not alone. Sometimes we feel that we're alone. He's, not, he's always there with us. I'll never leave you, he said. I'll never forsake you. So for for me, I just want to know all that he is, and I want to know how to serve him. And that's what Paul is saying. These false teachers are entering in. They're telling you, follow the Jewish legalism and mysticism and, and the Greek philosophy. Stay away from that. He says, they're trying to pull you away. They don't want you to hear my teachings, but remember the things that you've been taught. I'm the one God used to teach you those things. Epaphras may be giving you communication, but Paul was an apostle who gave God's word to people that they would communicate, and that's why he's writing to Colossians. And he's saying, you need to understand this. It pleased the Father that in Christ all of fullness should dwell. You need to understand that you're rooted and built up in him, that you are established in the faith. You need to know in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you need to know he's the head of all principality and power. That the angels, you're greater. You are actually in a position that they are your ministering spirits because you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. God is your father. Those angels don't have what you have. So don't worship angels because you are, are the ones that God has saved so that they may minister to you. So don't reduce yourself. Understand who you are. You are a child of God and God is on your side understand that and when you understand that that means you've been rooted and that means you've been built up so hold fast guys he's coming soon and we shall see him face to face